Welcome to Get Better Basketball Live. I'm Coach DeMarco, and today my guest is none other than a Hall of Famer and WNBA championship coach, Lynn Dunn. We're going to discuss how to use ball screens in your offense. You're not going to want to miss this episode. Before we jump into it, make sure you turn on your notifications and subscribe to my YouTube channel for more great content each and every week. Another Get Better Basketball Live is up now. Coach DeMarco here with Get Better Basketball Live. And today I'm very fortunate to have Hall of Fame coach and WNBA championship coach Lynn Dunn joining me. Coach, thanks so much for being here tonight. Great to be here, John. I'm excited about this. You know, I love the X's and O's. There are so many topics, you know, as I, I look throughout your career and so many great things that you've done as a coach and so many accomplishments. And, um, you know, we decided to go with ball screens tonight because you were one of the early adopters in the WNBA with using ball screens. But before we jump into that and maybe take a look at some clips, just curious, your, your background with using ball screens. I know you had a long career uh, in college as well. So when did you first start to use ball screens with your teams? Well, I think if you look back, John, you, uh, you know, men's college, women's college, uh, for a long time, it, it, there wasn't a lot of ball screens. You know, it was more, you know, mover blocker, uh, uh, motion, you know, Gene Cady's motion offense, Bobby Knight's motion offense. And there was a, not a lot of on-ball screening. And so uh, when I came into the pros, I really didn't have a, a, a real good background in the, what I call the two-man game. And so I started looking at the NBA and what, what are they doing? You know, what, what how are they playing? And um, wow, I, I just loved what I saw with what they were doing with the two-man game. And then, of course, Billy Donovan is another one of my uh, – I guess you'd call heroes that he always had that on a ball screen offense at Florida. Uh, and he was one of the first ones to do that. And so I, you know, I studied that, but I just thought that was a great offense for the WNBA. I thought it was, it, it fit the style of play quick up tempo. You can run down the floor and get right into a ball screen, transition ball screens, set up an offense and run ball screens. Um, and, and so we kind of built our, our franchise and our personnel around people that could play a, a ball screen type. And so, you know, we use the, the ball screen in transition. We use the ball screen, of course, in our horns plays. We use some ball screens in our, in our Princeton actions. And so we just blended it throughout our program, and it really fit what we were doing. Coach, from, from your experience using ball screens in your offense, what are, what are the, you know, as you refer to kind of the two-man game, what are the, the benefits that you see uh, from a ball screen offense? But then also, what are some of the challenges with, with uh, using ball screens in your offense? Well, I think one of the benefits, uh, especially in transition, is a, it, it's a, a quick hit. I love pushing the ball down the floor. The point guard passes it ahead to the wing, running the sideline, and the first post runs straight to that um, perimeter player and sets a quick on ball. And I think that is really, really hard to guard. Um, the, a quick action. I call it a quick on ball, you know, pass it ahead, quick on ball. Uh, the ball handler drives off the screen. She's headed to the paint. The screener can pop, she can roll, she can slide over, but you're running that action before defense ever gets set up. So I, th I think that's a great way uh, to run it. But now you can also run it on the side. You can run it at the elbows. And you can run it in the middle of the floor. And some people even run it in the corners. I'm not, I'm not, a favor of, uh, I'm not in favor of that because it's too easy to trap. Um, I, I can just tell you this, the hardest place to, to, to defend um, the two-man game is in the middle of the floor because you, you, you can't load up. You know, you, you get over there on the right side and run a two-man game, I'm going to stop you because I'm going to load over and I got all kinds of ways to keep you from getting where you want to go. But now in the middle – that's a whole nother ball game. So in, in terms of just thinking about the challenges or actually kind of the piggyback off of that too, what, you know, when we think about using ball screens, is there anything that defenses have done to your teams that have really, you know, gave you some challenges, whether it's, you know, hard hedging, switching, trapping, whatever, whatever that coverage might look like, but is there anything that teams have done to your teams 
that has been well, a challenge first, for you? Yeah, that's a great question. First of all, let me tell when I, when I start a ball game as a coach, I want to know two things. I want to know what your post defense is going to be that night. I want to, I'm going to find out early. I'm going to find out, are you doubling? Are you fronting? I want to know how you're defending the post. And I want to know how you're defending the two-man game. So very early on, I'm going to run a two-man action. Uh, if we get the jump ball, uh, it's going to be the first action in the middle of the floor. I'm going to find out, are you trapping? Are you switching? Are you hedging? And so now I know what your scheme is, at least for the first quarter. And so I know the actions that attack it the best. But I'm, I'm not going to wait till midway through the second half to start running. You know, I want to know those two things. I, I want to know. I know how you guard my post. Oh, my gosh, you're fronting us. We're going to uh, empty out the backside. We're going to move her up. We're going to lock. You know, so I want to know those two things. Um, I, I think what bothers the two-man game the most, uh, in my opinion, could be switching. If you're playing a great, I, I think of North Carolina women when I was coaching in college, their point guard was 6'2". You know what I'm saying? And, and so if you're, if you're playing a team that's athletic at every position and you, they switch every screen on ball and off ball, that's really tough. So, so switching is difficult. Um, I think icing um, is difficult because teams in particular um, at the college level don't don't work on how I'm going how am I going to attack icing and so icing has come in to play and that's harder to ice in the middle and so you know if you're icing me really tough over on the side then I may move my screens to the middle because I know it's harder for you to ice and you can't ice in the middle so don't think you can't but you can um, and then I, I think another scheme that, 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 that causes people problems is what I call ice red. And so as you come over to ice, you just go ahead and trap. And, and so that's very disruptive. And when you trap, everybody rotates. And all I'm giving you is the backside deep corner. And if you can get it over there, good for you. So, so people have come up with schemes and ways to, um, to, to cause problems. Uh, I, I think the trap. Uh, can be disruptive, but hey, the guards this nowadays, you trap them, they're going to come right around your big and they're off to the races. So your big that's trapping better be mobile, agile, hostile, all that, because these guards are so good. Well, I appreciate that you mentioned the switching actually in, in the, we're going to take a look at a, a couple of clips here in a minute, if that's, if that's good with you coach from uh, game four of the WNBA finals in 2012. And one of the things that you actually mentioned, they talked to you, uh, you know, during in between quarters or something like that. And you guys were trying to take advantage of those switches and whether it be a smaller player on one of your posts in the switch or a bigger player on one of your guards. And we're going to actually see that in, in some of these clips. In fact, I think maybe the first clip uh, you, you get a switch on January and she attacks the hoop, but um, that that does come up, and you guys ha did a really nice job in in this game attacking those switches and and taking advantage of the mismatches. Well, I can promise you, John, we practiced it. You know, like if you know a team's going to switch, are you going to take the big one on one and attack her, or are you going to roll the big down and post uh, her up or him up with the little on her? You've got two ways to attack there, but you have to practice it. All right, coach. So here's the first clip here, and I believe we're going to see that switch. So I'm going to play it through and just let me know if you want me to stop it. But definitely interested to get your insight on on this play here. So so right off the bat, one of the game plan, one, one piece of the game plan was to get Taj McWilliams into the two man game, get her to switch because we felt like of the two post players, she was the least mobile. It's not accidental that it's her. Yeah. The other post player is much more mobile, much more athletic, much more um, uh, agile. So we want Taj McWilliams now to switch off on Brienne January and have to guard her. Yeah, and she does a really nice job here, just turning the corner, seeing that matchup. Uh, we'll get another clip here in a minute where she scores, but just does a really nice job, you know, attacking the basket. So in this particular game, I, I like that you had mentioned, you know, in these switches, you can get the ball inside or you can attack. So as part of your game plan here, was it when you got this matchup that your guards were going to look to attack this post defender? 
Right. So, so then the we could attack the little down in the paint, or we could attack the big with the drive. Yes, we had either option. And she does a really nice job here, turning the corner. And we're going to see here in the next clip. Uh, again, I, I don't know if this is the same. Yeah, it looks like the same defender you, you guys are attacking here. And this time, uh, really nice finish at the basket. We come right back and we put this same uh, player that's vulnerable to the two-man game and see if she's going to switch again. And now she's going to switch down the middle. And fr freeze it right there. So as she attacks the paint right there, notice that Tamika Catchings is rising to the top everybody's in the paint so we've got three three-point shooters available out here if if uh if, if january didn't feel comfortable uh she could easily have slowed down and kicked it right back here and see they're all going to her and, and your roller is wide open at the top yeah and i wanted to ask you you know a question i have for coaches when it comes to uh using ball screens is what do you do with those you know those other three players philosophically what what is it that you try to do? Was it intentional here that you had catchings kind of coming up to the top? And Absolutely. And let me show you something. Erin uh, Phillips is where she's supposed to be in the ball side corner. Yeah, that's her right down here in the so ball she's side corner. She's ready for a three there. Catchings yep. is going to come to the top for a three. Now, uh, Zealous should be over there in the deep corner. If yep. she where she's out of position, if she's in that deep corner, see where Brent January is? She could have easily done a wraparound pass oh, and pin her in the corner. Their whole team, all five, is in the paint. So I've got the a potential to draw and kick for a three. Yeah, absolutely. No, they're they 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 have a spot they're supposed to be in. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's it's good. And you know, when you see, you know, I know coaches that comes up a lot in terms of you have your two man game and then those other three players and we'll actually see catchings in a couple minutes, get a three uh, back at the top off the ball screen. So I'm glad you pointed out that, you know, how she moved and actually, you know, where her positioning is going to be. So the next one we have here, coach is uh, a little bit of a side ball screen. And this is uh, Aaron Phillips and the next two clips we'll see are actually going to be ball screens on the side and involving her. So curious to get your perspective on this one as, as well. Okay. Now this, she's coming up and setting it on the baseline. Uh, a lot of people don't use that baseline two man game. They're always get up on the top side. I think, I think you need to be able to do both. So she uses the baseline and there as she comes across. Now look at the people she's got to kick to. Thought that was a really nice read too. You know, she sees the defense collapse and just a, a nice pass to get it between the defenders. And, um, you know, I know the basket doesn't fall, but just really well executed, uh, you know, the read all the way, all the way down the line. I think there's four, almost four defenders in, in the paint here. And so the next clip is going to be uh, the same action again. I want to ask you this because I hear this term like, rejecting ball screens it comes up a lot now is this something that you guys practiced um or is this just her kind of reading the defense and adjusting to what they're giving um but i'll let it play through so you can see but she makes a nice cross back away from the screen and of course catchings there is going to knock down the uh three-pointer she had a great great game so well, I, I think what she does is she freezes that defender because she she hedges, she hedges, mm -hmm. and her defender really goes with her, and she freezes her and comes back the other way because she sees an open lane there. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Like that, see the hedge, the, the player's hedging there, and so she yeah. comes right back. And so that's a, a defensive read. In other words, I'm not going to fight them. I'm going to take what they're giving me, and they're giving me a lane down the middle. One of the things that I, I noticed right away, I'm like, oh, boy, I'd like to look at another aspect of this game was the transition offense, the way that you guys ran and got out in transition in this game. I mean, the first couple of minutes of the game, it was like you, you got a rebound, and that ball was up the floor, and you were finishing. It was like the blink of an eye. And I was so, so impressed with how quickly that ball got up the floor, um, you know, in addition to this aspect of the game. 
And again, that's something if you're going to be a running team, and it doesn't have to be uh, five, it can be a, th that's a great, a point of wing and a post, a point of wing and a post, down, back, down and back. And so you're working on the, all the actions that you could possibly get uh, in a small sided game like that. And here comes uh, uh, catchings here in, in transition. Uh, she slows it up, but she's going to use this ball screen. And uh, she is so, so tough uh, going to the basket here, but does a really nice job. Actually goes away from the screen and, and gets in the paint and finishes. So I'll let that play. Yeah, again, she and sees the hard hedge and she's not going to fight the hedge, but she's going to freeze that defender. And look at that. Look at smart decision why would you want to go back into that when you've got all of that free area over there and uh, I, I thought that was a great decision uh, and that goes back to catching high basketball iq mm -hmm. absolutely so tough once she gets in you know into the pain so last two clips uh you know i just think the freedom the players have to make those decisions um and then you know to use the ball screen we saw early on with January and now these last couple of clips, you know, going away from the ball screen and, you know, getting into the paint and making things happen. So just a really, really nice, nice job here. And I think there's one more clip here and I just wanted to ask you a question. We're going to see a really nice job here off the screen, uh, nice advantage here and just going to, I'll freeze it on, on the kick out, but, just wanted to talk to you just about making these reads. Is there, you know, I, I feel like I'm watching this game and I know they're professionals, but I just feel like the reads that they make, whether they're going away from the screen, using the screen, finishing, kicking, it's just, it's really good every single time. And four players in the paint, she makes a nice kick out here. So just wanted to ask for coaches who are watching, you know, is this something that you guys repped in practice? Is there something specific? you did in film study um, to help players to make these reads the right way or correctly in, in the game and the flow of the game? Well, John, that's a great question. I, I think w what this is a great example of is a shooting drill. This is, this is a three person shooting drill. The screener's gonna get a shot, the driver's gonna get a shot, uh, the, and the kick's gonna get a shot. And so it's, it, it's practice. It's practice three on O, it's practice five on O, it's pra practiced in a shooting drill. And I'm a great believer in shooting drills being pieces of your offensive system. You know, there's a, there's a great place for volume shooting, but how many of your shooting drills are a piece of, uh, of your uh, offensive sets? Um, and the interesting thing here, of course, I got to talk about defense is I'm really surprised that Lindsey Whalen helped off a ball side shooter. To me, that is forbidden. You know, that is a rule you do not help off of a ball side a shooter. Um, the low defender, which looks like it's Brunson, um, should, should crowd her when she gets to the rim and not allow a ball side shooter to get a pass that's just a that's just a rule of mine defensively we, you, you don't you don't hedge you don't you don't uh, rake you know you don't stunt off of the the shooter uh, and she does and you know it's she's able to kick it's a great rebound but it's been practiced in a shooting drill as we had a chance to look at each of those clips i mean just those reads whether it's you know from that shooting drill that you guys worked on in practice but just a great job getting to the rim and then obviously you know, finishing inside as well. And wanted to ask you, kind of break it down a little bit more for, for coaches in terms of the role. So obviously there's there's the ball handler, you have the screener. Um, so just thinking about those, those ball handlers, um, you know, who would you say in, in your career as a coach is a player that you, you worked with, you had an opportunity to coach that was just great in this two-man game as a ball handler, a good facilitator, good finishing, but just making really, really quality reads. Um, who's a player that you coached in your career that did a really nice job? Well, of course, Tamika Ketchings was was excellent at that. You know, we moved her from the three to the four, though, that, that year, so she wasn't involved in the two-man game as much. But you can put a four or five in a two-man game. 
and, and that can be really difficult to defend. Um, I think Katie Douglas, uh, who was our shooting guard, and you, you don't see her in these clips because she injured her ankle severely uh, in, the, in the round before this, uh, was one of the smartest uh, at the two-man game that I coached. Uh, she was a lefty. Uh, she was six foot. But, but really, really high basketball IQ. She did not try to beat you by outquicking you. Um, she used four or five different speeds. She understood timing. She understood spacing. Um, she knew where she wanted the screen. And I think that's really important. You know, do you want it on the side above um, the free throw line extended? Do you want it in the middle? Where do you, where, where are you better? Where are you best in the two man game? Uh, she knew how, she knew what the counters were. If somebody iced her, she knew what to do about it. If somebody trapped her, she knew what to do. Um, if there was a hard hedge, she knew how to get around the hedger. She knew how to hit the roller. Um, she, she just understood uh, the game really well. Um, but if you're going to run a two-man offense, then you have to spend time knowing how to attack six or seven possibly different two-man defenses. Don't just assume everybody's going hard hedge. I wish that's all they ever did, hard hedge. But, but we've got all uh, – we're over, we're through, we're under, we're icing, you know, we're trapping, um, we're switching. Uh, so uh, we're double switching, you know, the, I love the double switch where the two, the post and switch and switch and uh, man, there's all kind of schemes. So you have to understand that you can't just say, I'm going to run a two man game. Well, they switch. Well, what are we going to do? Well, you, you need to know, you need to have a plan. And, and I think teams don't spend enough time on what, how will we attack icing? If we're iced on the side, how, how what are we going to do? Um, I see that as a weak link, uh, and that's why I would I would urge coaches. You know, if if I was going to play on the side, I'd ice everything on the side. You're on the side. You went over there. You're staying over there. You're not coming back to my middle. Basketball one hundred and one. Don't let the ball get in the middle of the floor. Yep. Well, okay. I'm on. I'm not going to let you get in the middle of the floor. Now, show me what you can do. So, Coach, we talked a little bit about the guard aspect of it, but obviously there's the other piece to it, which is the screeners. And, you know, in terms of, you know, what, what makes a good screen, obviously one that hopefully you can gain some type of advantage, but, you know, what makes a, a good screen? And, and also thinking about, you know, we talked about the reads from the, the point guards a lot, but what about reads from those post-type players? You know, were you guys – did you guys slip and pop? And was there different things that, you know, obviously roll to, but was there different things that they were able to do? So I, I guess just thinking about the role of the screener and, and what makes someone really great in that role as, as a screener. Um, yeah, and I, and I think you made me think of something, you know, and, and I use this word all the time, the details, the details of the execution. Ex great execution uh, is not accidental. It happens when you do the details exactly right. The ball handler waits for the screen. The ball handler uses the screen shoulder to shoulder. The ball handler reads her defender. She reads the screener's defender. Um, the screener comes up, and I, I love this. If it's on the side, you get a, a piece of a leg and a piece of a butt. You know, I want you to get a piece of a leg and a piece of a butt. That that way, I know you're going to bump that that uh, that defender, um, and you know how to roll, and you know how to catch, and you have the footwork to catch and finish. And so it's, it happens. It's taught in breakdown drills. Let's say on one end you've got a three on three group working on the two man game versus a hard hedge. And then on the other end, you've got a group working on the two man game versus how we're gonna attack um, ice. And then we may flip it the next day and we're working on switching. And, we're, and so we're teaching them how to do it before we put it into the five on O and five on five system. So it has to be taught. And then as we, we play teams in the pros five times, six times. Even in college now, they're playing three, four, three, four times. So you can expect 
some different schemes um, in the two-man game, but doing the little things right it is so important. It, the footwork, the jump stop, the pivot, um, taking your man into that screen. If you're the ball handler, it's your job to take your defender into the screen. That's your job. And if you and if she jumps over because there's space there, then then you didn't do your job. And then, but you also have to know, okay, she got over. What's the counter? I, I'm a great believer in counters. There's a counter to everything. You do something, I'm gonna do something else. It's like chess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, it's it's interesting as I watch those those clips, and obviously watching the whole game as well. But the way that the players use screens, you talked about shoulder to shoulder, and that was consistent throughout the game, the way they set defenders up, whether they were going to use the screen or even that clip with catchings where she kind of went in and out, set the defender up one way and then went, went away from the screen and, and finished strong. So just really impressive the way, you know, those details to see that in action from an NBA championship, WNBA team. It's just, it's, it's amazing to go through that. And, and I want to bring back the three other players outside of the screen we talked about it specifically to uh, this game and, and where Catchings was coming back up to the top, but just curious um, kind of to revisit that. What is it with those other three players and, and how, how do they be, how are they great in that role? We know a great ball handler, a great screener, the reads that they're making, what makes a player great if they're not in the two man game, what are the things that they can do to be successful? Well, and I think that's a key to a successful two-man offense is what are the three players doing that aren't actually involved in the on-ball screen because they're key. Spacing is crucial. Where are they? What are they doing when the action is happening? How are they responding if she slips, if she rolls? What if she pops? You know, so they have to be aware of what their job is and, and they can't be out of position. It, it, where they are for the kick is not accidental. There's always somebody in that deep corner. You know, this, this is how you execute this because you're not always gonna be the one. You gotta come off that screen ready to shoot, ready to pass, ready to kick. Um, and read what what may be there, but the spacing on the backside, and I, I'm I'm a great believer in all three of them being free elbow to the side. You know, I don't want somebody on to the ball side of the elbow. I want that space all the way over there. I want that top person, and I like the top person to be the four or the other post. Um, if it's the five setting it and the fours, because and especially if she can shoot, because then X4 can't go help. X4 can't jump down, go down in there and say, well, I'll get five. No, your man's going to hit a three. Uh, some people like to double away and screen and pin in. I don't like that. I like you to spot up, get behind the three point line and be ready. Um, that, that's my preference. I think when you go in, you take the defense in and now you've jammed up the paint. I really appreciate you, you taking us through kind of each of those different pieces to the ball screen. And, you know, it's, it's intriguing to hear your perspective and the details that go into each aspect. If you're going to successfully use a ball screen from the ball handler to the screener to the other players on the floor and how it all kind of comes together. And, you know, as we think about, you know, using screens or using ball screens, I, I guess the best type is the one that gets you, uh, an easy basket, but um, for you throughout your career, what has been the type of ball screen that you feel, you know, you've gone to the most or something that has really worked well for your teams as, as a coach? Well, the best screen is putting the weakest post in the screen. If you can pull, you know, you can't go down there and post up on big girl and score around or over, but pull her out and get her out of the paint and get her. It's not accidental who's in the screen. Uh, if five is in the screen and X five's got to come out, I want her to have to defend. And so I like to know, okay, what? how can we exploit uh, the center? You know, what, what screen? It could be a side screen, it could be a middle screen, but it's not accidental who we put in the screen. 
Uh, I really like the middle step up screen, the, the come up from behind. I like it in transition. And uh, I, I, I encourage coaches, uh, if you're with your point wing post work, running the floor, first post runs to the three point lines, turns around, steps up, and she's ready to set a blind back screen, leave, give, leave the room, it, it's legal. And so your, your, your lead guard, whoever it might be, one, two, or three, whoever's got the ball, has the option to go off of either side of that step up screen. I think it's very difficult to guard. But if somehow your defender gets over, then it's immediate rescreen. And that's the hardest screen, I think. The step up, and then boom, she got under, and I turn right around and I slam her again, and now I'm off to the races. Yeah, that's, I, to I think that's the hardest screen to, to deal with. I wanted to ask you because I saw that in transition as I watched the game. So is that that's something that's predetermined for for your team in this particular game? You know, something that you guys did throughout the season in transition. You know, you don't get that fast break opportunity, but in the secondary opportunity, your posts were taught to set some type of ball screen um, more frequently than not. Absolutely. Let's remember this: in your first way, that's your first. I call it the first way. If your first post has got a breakaway layup, go to the rim. If she, if I mean, but she's got to make that read around the half line. She knows at the half line. Okay, I'm, I've got. To, I'm, I'm gonna get a layup. She reads at the half line. I'm, I'm not gonna have a breakaway layup. So I'm going to be involved in a step up screen, or I may be if she passes it ahead. I'm in that early quick on ball. So it could be two. It's, it's not. You don't want to be too predictable, coach. You don't want – okay, she passed ahead quick on ball. She held on to it, didn't have a layup. Now i got the step-up screen. Oh, we might just dribble into a gun action. Mm -hmm. So there's three actions there uh, instead of just one. And, mm -hmm. and that's a tip for all the offensive coaches. Make sure that you're not predictable. You've only got one action. Well, then I know how to stop that because you don't have a counter. appreciate you kind of sharing that perspective. And, and you know – Thinking about, we've, we've talked about offense. I could probably sit here and, and talk for a long time. I love defense, defensive-minded coach, so I could probably sit here for, for three hours and talk defense. But just want to ask one quick question in terms of ball screens and ball screen defense. I know you talked about the side ball screen and icing it. Um, just, just want to get your perspective or some quick pointers for coaches in terms of ball screen defense. We're seeing it more and more at the NBA all the way down, you know, even in the high school game now, there's a ton of teams uh, using ball screen offenses, college level, obviously, as well, and both, both all, all types of basketball. So just a question for you is just what are those keys for you as a coach if you're trying to defend a team that's using, you know, ball screen 60% of the time? Well, first of all, figure out as is a scouting piece – what are they trying to get out of the ball screen? Is the ball screen for a guard that's quick as lightning so she can get down and into your paint and get to the rim? Is that what it's for? Is it for, so she can do a step back three? Because what the guard that's in the screens the most, what she can and can't do affects your, your, your scheme. And so if I ask somebody, say, well, why are you hard hedging all the time? Well, that's what we've always done. Oh. Well, well, every time you hard hedge, that big rolls to the rim and, and the little comes right over the hard hedge. The big never is – she's gone for the rest of the play. She never gets back in the play. And that guard just flips it up in the air to the big. So, if, if you want to stop that big, then you need to stop hard hedging. Oh, okay. Well, how do I do that? Well, let's look at some other schemes. You know, we may flat show and I never leave the big. You know, we may fight over and flat show. We may slide through. That guard can't hit the broad side of a barn outside the paint. Well, then, okay, I'm going to meet her at the nail because I know that's a little bit out of her range because she's trying to get to the rim. So I'm thinking about what scheme will bother this particular two-man action the most. It's not about what I like to do. It's about what, what hurts, what bothers um, uh, the, the people involved in it. Uh, I don't know why more teams don't put the five on the two uh, on the side and then they hard hedge and the guard kicks it to the four and the four slams it to the rim to the five. She's wide open. 
Well, maybe one that's over there in the corner, X1 may be down there at her knees, but you know, that's a great way to exploit um, a hard hedge. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't. I don't know how you stop it. Well, four has to be able to shoot. You know what I'm saying? So um, it's it's but, interesting. Um, it's interesting too because I think for a period of time there, I'm thinking back to like uh, big Celtics fan from the Boston area, and uh, you know they hard hedged a lot when they had Kevin Garnett and they had the championship team there, and I feel like at that time that that was the thing. Everyone was hard hedging, and now you're seeing a lot more teams that are starting to switch ball screens if they're able to do so. I know you mentioned that could be really effective, but, um, you know, it's just you interesting. Slide through, you know, slide through and, and flat, flat show. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the bigs in the NBA. Now, some of these seven foot two people, they just patrol the paint. You know what I'm saying? They're, they're saying, you know, we're going to give you a 16, 17 footer, but you're not getting to the, I'm a rim protector. So yep. it just depends on the opponent and what you want to do to them. And remember this guards have gotten a lot better. Long time ago, guards didn't know how to handle all of these different schemes. Mm -hmm. You know, like trying to figure out how to guard uh, Steph uh, Curry and trying to figure out how to guard, uh, you know, some of these guards. Now they're so good. And even the college guards now, the, the, the women, uh, college women and women pros, they're great ball handlers. They understand the game better. You know, you hard hedge and that's all you can do. You, you know, somebody's going to exploit you. So think about what type of scheme do you need to use that will bob this little guard. All she wants to do is get down the paint. Well, then that's I'm gonna ice her, mm -hmm. and she's she's if she goes anywhere, she's going down to the corner around, and that's she don't want to go down there. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm trying to do things with my schemes that disrupt uh, your best players. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a great I think that's a great point, and I want to ask because. Talk, speaking to the point of, you know, making those adjustments from game to game. And I have to ask a little bit off topic from the ball screens, but um, I, I noticed in, in the WNBA finals here, and maybe you did this throughout the year and I haven't seen all the, the games on film. It's been eight, nine years now, but um, you guys went to a zone on sideline out of bounds situation. So I'm like, I have to ask this question while I have you is, you know, what, why that, was that an adjust, was that something you did all the time or was it, they had an inbounds play or something that could give you problems You said, you know what, we're going to go to a zone and we're going to switch in the zone and then we'll match up. But I'm curious why you guys went to a zone and those sideline out of bounds. Uh, th that's a great question. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of reasons why you do that. One reason why you may go to that is because you're in foul trouble. You know, you, you a couple of key people, uh, have gotten a, a, a foul and, and, you know, and you, you're heard and you're knowing, okay, we got to figure out a way, could be fatigue. Okay, how can I rest a little bit on a couple of possessions? Okay, well, well the zone's a lot uh, less stressful than the other. Or, or in a particular, hey, just show a different look. Mm -hmm. You know, like w w they, they're expecting us to be man-to-man. Uh, -man. They're expecting us to do this. Okay, so we know the play they're going to run, and it doesn't work very good against the 2-3 zone. So, may only do it one or two possessions, but in a in a close um, championship game, every possession is gold. You know, if you can get an, uh, a bad shot or a turnover or, you know, and so just, it's it's all about adjustments. And I want to say this, Coach, because you, you brought it up. You know, that is the challenge for a head coach is being able to adjust as the game is going along. You may have a plan and that plan may go right out the window, <laughs> right off the bat. And so I always thought it was important to say, what if, what if, what if they do this? What am I going to do? What if they do this? What if this happens? It, I was always playing in my mind and with my assistants, well, what if? Well, what if? What if they go to a one through one half court trap? Oh, coach, they're not going to do that. Well, what if they do? You know, I, I wanted to be prepared so that whatever they threw at me, I could throw right back at them. Okay, you're going to do that? Well, guess what I'm going to do? You know, so that being able to adjust is just a real key, I think, to being a successful coach. Yeah, absolutely. And that's not an easy thing to do. And, and you know, during the game or, you know, in a series like, you know, you guys played in a 
best of five series. And it's like a chess match, you know, back and forth uh, with adjustments on, on both sides. And I can imagine that's, that's challenging as you play it. You have to beat a team, you know, three times in that series. And that's not an easy task against, you know, another championship caliber team. Well, especially when you don't have home court advantage. So see, we weren't, there's no way we were supposed to win. That's just what wasn't supposed to happen. And that's why it was even sweeter when we did it. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed like you guys were having a lot of fun out there in that last game as you had the lead there. And uh, Well, yeah, but it, I watched that game not too long ago. It was closer than I remembered it. I remember us winning. I thought, golly, Bill, that was, you know, that came right down to the wire. Um, but, um, you know, I, I encourage any coach that wants to run the two-man game, invest in it. Um, but make sure you're balanced. You, I don't think you can have all of anything. You've got to have a, a, a blend of offenses that on any given night you can go to, you know, uh, are you playing off the elbow? Are you playing off the side? Are you playing in the middle of the floor? Do you have inside-outside balance? Uh, you know, I think you have to constantly be evaluating um, your offensive system and how, how you can create ways to score. Yeah, and you know, as I as I watch that series and at least that final game, you know, seeing the way that in which you guys were prepared and how you use ball screens and the thought process into all those other details, um, you know, you you could see that. So I think that's great advice for coaches. And um, as we wrap up here, is there any other advice you would have for coaches when it comes to incorporating ball screens? I feel like you've brought forth so many great pointers as we watch the film and then even beyond that um you know if there's a coach watching here and they want to be a better ball screen team is there anything you would say to them uh, well I, I would think i would say teach it teach it you know the with two people then teach it with three teach it full court you know uh like i said the ball screen should be part of your whole system it should be part of your transition it should be part of your quarter court offense and it should be part of your zone offense for some people for some reason people have don't realize that a great way to attack a zone is with a, a an on ball screen and so it, it has to be you have to invest in it and it has to be we are fully invested in this we're going to invest time in it and we're going to do the details right and we're going to know how to handle every type of defense that's thrown at us we're going to be prepared we're going to be prepared well coach i i appreciate your time uh tonight and i i wanted to wrap up with a great quote of yours and just Get your perspective. Um, it's, you know, if better is possible, good is not enough. And I know there's a lot of coaches from high school all the way up to the pros that want to push players to that next level. And I just wanted to get your perspective on that quote and how you've been able to, you know, winning a championship is no easy task. And for you to be able to push your players to always strive to do better. And, uh, you know, it's a great quote, one of my favorites, and I'm uh, curious to get your perspective. Well, it's always been something that's kind of been a, a motto for me, you know, like if better is possible, good is not enough. And so it, it, it makes you constantly strive to continue to get better. It's a great motivator. It, you know, I love to say to a kid, you know, you're, you're good, you're getting good, but can you be better? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, coach, I think, well, what can you do to be better? Tell me what you can do to be better. Well, I could come in, okay, then then if better's possible, then, then good right now, it's not enough. But I think as a coach, I always said that to myself. You know, can I be better? What do I need to do? Do I need to go read another book, watch another clinic, you know, pull out some old Bobby Knight practice tapes? You know, wh what do <laughs> I need to do to continue to be a lifelong learner? because I am a, I'm a great believer um, that when you're through learning, you're through. That's another one of my favorites. When you're through learning, you're through. So I want to know the newest technique, the newest ideas. I want to know the new concepts. I want to talk to people, other coaches. I've got some coaching friends. We talk a couple of times a week about X's and O's. I'm an X and O groupie. I mean, I just love it. I always have. I can watch film. I can watch, I can watch five, six games in one day. Uh, but but I love to learn, and so um, that that all goes with uh, if better is possible, good is not enough. You just keep pushing yourself to be better, to be never satisfied, never satisfied, and that's 
the bottom line. Well, Coach, thank you so much. I, I appreciate you joining me. It's been an honor to talk to you and be able to pick your brain and even watch some film clips with you as well. So, you know, thank you so much for being on and sharing your expertise with all the coaches out there. Well, you're welcome. And let me tell you what, thank you for what you do. Thank you for all of the clinics you do, all of the, uh, the Twitter nights where we all talk about different uh, pieces of the game. Uh, I, I hope you realize how thankful we are that you do what you do. Thank you. Well, thank you. That means a lot coming from you, Coach. Uh, be well and have a great night. Thank you.